For the saints, the promises of God are continually held out before us. The prospects of everlasting life and inheritance unto glory, these are the things that we look to, where our hope is, our confidence is, and all our expectations are placed in the one who said, I lose none that the Father gives me. Now, that's our mindset. That's the perspective of the saints. That's right. uh, we to, to fully possess and to receive the promises of God. Now, one day, we will not be hindered from this kind of thing. One day, there won't be any obstacles. And we'll, uh -huh. there will be no time. I mean, you like, we say it here 24-7, but it really won't even be that. We can all the time for eternity pursue those things that we've, we're creating a desire for and an appetite for now. We'll be able to do that. But at this time, brethren, at this time, uh, we cannot. We cannot forget where we are presently. And that if the saints are not diligent and not sober about our circumstances and, our, and the place we're at, uh -huh. we could very well be swept away yeah. by the cunning of the flesh, the deceitfulness right. of the flesh, and, and the deceit and the wickedness of our times. Because, uh, you know, both this world and our flesh, it works against the hope we have in God. So it's just all the time there. It's no time, it's not. All the time. Daylight in the dark. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, Paul says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul is exhorting Timothy in the good fight of faith is what he's doing. Because Paul would later say in Ephesians, he would introduce himself. He said, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, I wanted to make this point because I don't think we get to do it very often. But, you know, uh, there's a point of view where the Apostle Paul is our apostle. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, he was called of God to go to the Gentiles, to us. Matter of fact, uh, we were those who were one time uh, afar off. A one time without God and Christ in the world, and who were not a people, now the people of God. So he, uh, Paul was sent to those brethren mm -hmm. like that. And so uh, we want to esteem Paul with the highest regard. Yes, amen. And, to, and so I take the time to do that because, you know, Paul gives us this good word. We're thankful for Brother Paul. We thank God for him. We're thankful for uh, the many expositions of the truth and and, and all these things he's given us in the scriptures, and particularly this one this morning, his careful connection between a military soldier and a soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, because Paul, now he's not the only, only apostle and writer that saw this, but, but Apostle Paul, that would, you have to think about him, and that was his, his, his uh, premise from where he worked when he was talking about our conflict. Paul recognized that the same qualities that uh, exists in a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He saw that in a good military soldier as well. Characteristics that each warrior must have. They want to please him who has uh, who's chosen him to be a soldier. Even though one soldier's fighting in his physical realm, the other and the other fights in the spiritual realm. They both seem to sh they both share the same capacities that make for victory. We want to remember that now these conclusions that Paul came to. Uh, they were based on his personal contact with the Roman army. Uh, they weren't just uh, uh, merely general sightings, general observations at a distance. Uh, you're like a, a distant observer. You know, it, it was hardly going to a town in those days without there being a strong presence of the military there. But see, Paul, he had, he had firsthand knowledge of what he was talking about. He, he had personal contact with the military. You remember, and I'm going to go over just real briefly and uh, familiarize you again with some of these. He was always with them. He was either with the brethren or he was with the military authorities. Uh, you remember the magistrates in, in, uh, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas was beaten and thrown into prison. Well, that was done by the Roman authority. They did this. Uh, and that uh, the Philippian jailer that Paul later baptized later that night was a Roman soldier. Uh -huh. uh, in Acts 23, when, Jeros um, when Paul was delivered from the hands of the Jewish mob by the chief captain of the guard, uh -huh. his soldiers and centurions, and he was placed in Roman chains, uh, this, this was a military. Paul was later given, uh, delivered by the military, by a Jew Jewish pot, plot. And uh, by the order of the tri triune, remember, uh, he was taken to Caesarea. He was taken by an escort of uh, two centurions, 
200 soldiers, 70 mounted soldiers, and 200 soldiers, more soldiers with spears. Uh, it was during this time in Caesarea for two years. Paul was, uh, Paul's personal guard was a centurion soldier. It was uh, in Caesarea at this time that Paul appealed to Rome, to the high court of Caesar. And then, of course, in the book of, at the uh, close of the book of Acts, then Paul is under house arrest still, and no doubt he's chained to a Roman soldier. So, it's, I mean, uh, you know, and who else can better speak of these kind of things? I mean, in, in the closing chapters uh, of Colossians, Paul reminds the brother, remember my bonds, remember my chains. So uh, we know it was by the means of the military that God delivered Paul and, and, and uh, preserved him. But, uh, but his length of exposure to the ways of the military gave him a, uh, to be a credible witness of the conflict the saints face in this world. And so being bound by chains and being taken here and there and being uh, always with the Roman uh, soldiers, Paul would speak naturally then. It, you, it would seem natural for Paul to speak naturally uh, of the service in the kingdom being so much likened to the military battle from Paul's perspective. So he was able to say, Paul was able to say, ye are soldiers of Jesus Christ. Now think of Paul in prison or chained to a Roman soldier when you read passages such as these. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Second Corinthians 6, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. In Ephesians 6, Paul draws a complete parallel with the body armor of the Roman soldier with the armor that God has provided for the saints. Now, we see in, in chapter 6, for example, that a lot of this body armor is, uh, is, is being given to us as a, as a defensive posture, provisions of the spirit. But, you know, much of our warfare in this world is, is, is taking a defensive posture, that's for sure, against the fiery darts, uh, using the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, all defensive. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, that's our defensive position we've got as saints, but I, there is an offensive position of, uh, that the saints are equipped for too. Uh, I'm sure... Paul had the soldier Christ in mind when he said, we throw down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and bringing into captivity every thought. Now, Paul is very keen on the fact that we're called in close proximity to the enemy. Uh, he said we wrestle in, in Ephesians 6, but not with flesh and blood. Right. Our engagement and our fighting is, up, is an up-close battle. It's a hand-to-hand -hand conflict. So we wear the armor of light, and we carry the shield of faith, and we have our helmet of salvation on. But in our hands, we have the spirit, the sword of the spirit. That's the aggressive posture as a soldier of Christ. And we can take down things, and we can throw down things. And in the defense of we stand, we hold fast. This is the way we overcome. And so the ground we get and we obtain, we're able to hold this ground that we've taken. And we can stand fast in the progress that we've made. That's the aggressive nature of salvation and then our defensive position. We don't, we don't lose what we've got. No man that wore to entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. That's what Paul told Timothy right after that other verse. Now, I'm sure you're familiar enough with the Roman military. Uh, you've been in the, around it long enough in, in the church and stuff that to know you've been told that how professional the Roman military was. That uh, the Roman soldier had, he had no outside interest in anything but the next military campaign. That's all he had on his mind. You, uh, a Roman soldier wasn't a carpenter and a soldier. He wasn't a lawyer and a soldier. He was just a soldier 100% all the time. That's what he did. He soldiered. And, uh, and everything he did was in regard to being a soldier. Uh, he had no other interest than staying fit mentally and physically for the next engagement. He was, men he, uh, he was mentally alert and ready. Uh, so this mindset 
of a whole host of thousands of soldiers like this, but then you can account how the Roman Empire was able to conquest so much territory and then hold it too. Soldiers of Jesus Christ, they cannot please him if they get sidetracked and bogged down in the affairs of life, just like the military and the Roman army. He couldn't, he couldn't be quick to respond to any kind of command. So this is the exhortation that Paul received of Timothy. Now, I'll tell you, I thought about that a minute. Now, if Timothy, now, if he could, if he was up for an exhortation like that, I mean, what does that mean for me? You know, so uh, we, uh, we I, I think that exhortation fits for us today, too. In view of the conflict we face. Now, in the military, like such as the Romans, as an example, we're talking about a physical realm. And then, uh, but we're able to reason on spiritual truths using this. And we have the capacity to do this. We've been, able, we've been given that provision. Paul uses analogies and metaphors um, of the physical realm to teach spiritual truths. He, that was the way Paul done. That's the way the Bible writer is done. He'll use architectural terms to, to help us get a hold of the body of Christ and the habitation of God. And he does the same thing with the military. And uh, because it was important for Paul to understand the conflict we faced. And so he used military terms. He used terms like war and battle and conflict and fight. And because that's what it is. So now today, this is, our, this is actually our training and preparation for the conflict that never goes away, brethren. Anytime your attention is being diverted or anytime there's an attempt for your attention to be diverted, we've, we've been talking about this kind of thing already today, then that's a conflict. And so we, we can throw these kind of things down, and we want to be always sensitive mm -hmm. to any kind of intrusion to our, our connection to Christ. Amen. So this morning, we, uh, we, we're exhorted, you know, to be ever mindful, uh, even in our assembly, of the conflict we face when the enemy would come along and try to, try to distract us. So um, with that, I call you up higher to consider these yeah. things. Amen. And soldiers of Jesus Christ... Yeah. So it's, it's not uncommon, even in the military, for, the, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the rank and file soldiers to be exhorted yes. to be more diligent. And so that's what we do among ourselves. So um, I will uh, I'll have a prayer, and then I'll turn it back over to Brother Jonathan. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our opportunities to meet together, Father, and to hear good things. Father, we're uh, often reminded of the many things you provided for us to take a hold of. And we pray that you would uh, bless us with this this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.